All right, everybody, uh, I want to get started. I only have uh, 30 minutes, and I got a lot, a lot of things I really want to talk about. Um, right away, I want to ask how many people have read either of these books, Design Patterns in Ruby or Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable Object Software? All right, excellent. So um, I'm gonna, we're going to talk more about these, these principles up here, but if, there's, if you only dip into this talk for two minutes and then you leave, I, one thing I'd like you to take away from it is how much I believe design, how, how important I believe in upfront design is in, in startups. And uh, these principles have been very helpful to me and I wish I had read these books earlier because I feel like I would have saved myself uh, some, some pain. Um, my name is Mike Sabelsky. Uh, I'm one of the co-founder of the company Other Inbox, which is based here in Austin. And uh, this talk is really just like, what have I learned while building the product? So if I could go back in time and tell, you know, two years ago, tell myself, here's all the things you're going to encounter and ways to save time. Here's what you really should have been trained to do. Uh, this is what I would tell myself. All right, no, no problem. <laughs> so uh, I, I, the question was, do I, do I run on a treadmill while I program? Uh, I have a treadmill desk, and uh, it's, it's on our, our, our recruiting page, um, which gives me a good excuse to talk about recruiting, so thank you. Uh, I, I have a desk set up with, to, to write code on, but I don't actually use it that much because if you think about uh, when you're doing a task where you have to turn your music off, um, that's the kind of thing where you have to stop the treadmill. So if you're walking at one mile an hour, you can easily comfortably type. So it's good for like, I can treadmill and write emails and things like that, but as soon as I write code, I find I have to stop it. And so what, what would happen is like three hours would go by while I'm in the zone and I realize I haven't been treadmilling. So what's the point of having this elaborate desk? So it's a nice gimmick to be able to talk about at conferences, but practically not that interesting. But there is a whole community of people on the internet who are into treadmill desks. So if you Google it, if that sounds intriguing to you, you go check it out. Or you can buy mine from me. Um, <laughs> All right, so my talk is called Ruby for Startups. And really, I mean, you know, good code is good code no matter what environment you're in. So, but but the, what I'm talking about is that what's unique about being in a startup as opposed to other environments, as opposed to building a, a project for somebody else where you're a consultant or doing something open source or doing it for yourself. Well, it's, it's really these things. Um, typically, in a startup, you're, you're build, you don't even know what problem you're solving. So you're, you're creating an unknown solution to an unknown problem. Uh, maybe this isn't true 100% of the time, but at least with other inbox and a few other of my friends that I've helped, um, the idea that we started with is so radically different from what the ending result is. That even when you think you have it really well specced out, it's going to be so simple, it's really going to solve this big problem, um, ultimately you were, you were on the wrong track. So you're going to be changing your tracks. And you almost always have scarce time and resources. I mean, unless you're spun out from some bigger company that's funding you, um, typically you're writing code under kind of uncomfortable circumstances. You need to start making revenue right away. You need to prove out your idea right away. And so that colors everything you do at the level of your craft. In fact, like, I don't know if anybody reads Eric Ries's blog, uh, Startup Lessons Learned, but it's extremely influential to me. And he has this great line in here. Uh, he, his whole point is that startups are really learning engines. And so what it's like to be writing code inside of a learning engine like that is this ferocious, customer-centric, rapid I iteration. All right. So uh, this talk is, uh, is loosely organized, and it's just about what, I, what would I tell myself uh, about how to thrive in these conditions. I really boiled it down to two things. One, um, I would spend, I, I would not, I would resist the urge to be a cowboy and just write off and start writing code and start, you know, fulfilling the, the, the re requirements, uh, you know, for what I thought the software had to do. I would spend a lot more time uh, on the whiteboard, not doing like formal documentation or doing anything, you know, with like, I, I don't know, all special case tools or, or fancy things like that. I'm just talking about thought experiments, imagining things, really taking the time to talk about some of the stuff that we've already seen today about, you know, with the, how, how different ways you could use modules and namespace and the kind of things that, that you talked about in the, in the classes yesterday. I mean, I'm self-taught as a programmer and as a Rubyist, and I don't think there's enough material out there for, for autodidacts on, on good design. That's one of the reasons I wanted to start with those two books, because I've I think especially the Russ Olson book is so accessible to somebody who's never been 
formally trained in design. So that's the first thing I would tell myself to do is uh, spend more time designing and um, learn more about design so you can, your, your, the result is better. And then I would also just give myself like a long litany of mistakes to avoid or, or, or good practices. And then, you know, I, I would be spewing them at my, myself as I'm fading back into the ether, returning to, to future time. I, I wouldn't stop to, oh, it's going to be really hard to implement SSL. You're going to work about this. Ah, and then it disappear. All right, so uh, first part of my talk, now that we've gone, done with the prefatory material, good design. Uh, Russ Olson pulls out four ideas from the original Gang of Four book, the Design Patterns book, uh, and then he adds one that's kind of more unique to our culture, and I'm going to go through these one at, one at a time here. Um, some of these I have more specific ex examples from others because we haven't encountered all of these problems in even order, and I just wanted to mainly give you as much real-world stuff as I could. So first of all, separating out the things that change from the things that stay the same. If you've read like other kinds of software development literature, this is called design for change also. And the idea is you want to take things that are, um, that, that are, that are general, like, the, like actually, for example, the preceding talk from, from ThoughtBot. I mean, that, that's like core to what they do. Anything, it, it appears to me that if they build anything that is not absolutely specific for one of their clients, they make an open source gem or a plugin out of it, uh, and then that, can, that lives far away from the application code that's more likely to change. Uh, or uh, things like you know, the formats of a file, or global, global variables, or input and output formats. These are all things that over the life of your project are gonna change. So what you do is you isolate those design decisions into their own modules and use things like encapsulation and information hiding so that you can mess around with the internals of that stuff, you can swap out external services and APIs without having to really do a whole bunch of changing for the rest of your app. So here's a specific example. Um, first time in other inbox, like when we started to really deal with a heavy volume of mail, um, we, need, we used a uh, simple queue service from Amazon to, to scale, to be able to share the workload across boxes. So this is probably what a lot of people would do. Uh, I'm using this gem that gives me a nice interface to SQS. I just Threw it into a constant, and I had it in a, an initializer in our Rails app. Uh, and then, you know, first time I needed to use a queue inside of one of my classes, I just used that constant to initialize it. And that's actually fine. There's really nothing wrong with that. Uh, we weren't even sure we wanted to use SQS, so great. Well, then we started to, like, use it for everything, like every part of our app. You know, we have a significant amount of back-end processing that we do, and we pipe a lot of it through SQS. So this patterns started to appear all over, and you know we were moving a million miles a minute with our ferocious iterations, and nobody ever really thought, oh, you know, this is getting to be pretty brittle, and if we ever wanted to like use a different uh, messaging provider, or if something significant, like what if we want to change, oh, like, well, here, I have fancy little graphics here. Like what if we want to use a different provider, or what if we want to change the naming convention for what these queues look like? Well. That happened at the same time. Uh, Amazon uh, deprecated or got, got rid of the original version of SQS, and we had to move to SQS2. And we, did, we, need, we had so many of these SQS queues going on that the naming conventions really had to change. So we took this as a good time to do some refactoring, and we never had to worry about this again. And this is what the, the code looks like now. Now, whenever you want a queue, you just ask the queue fetcher, uh, module to get it for you. You just give it the simple name, like a queue name would be something like mail. Like I, I want to look at the mail queue. And you don't really care how it's name spaced or organized. You don't even really know at this point that you're using Amazon. You're, you're really dealing with like a general type here. Uh, and then you just manipulate that queue however you want. Uh, and the, the actual uh, queue itself looks like this, or the, that class, it's very simple. It does this, what we did before, but now anytime we want to change something to do with our queuing system. We only have to change it in one place. It doesn't really have a big ripple effect to the rest of the app. Um, this is even a little bit more isolation than I'm going to talk about later. Uh, it's our, our config variables, our, you know, our global variables, uh, our, sort of our application state. We put, that, we put that into its own module, which I'll show you about how to do later. I'm actually not 100% sure, sure I like the way that is when I started putting this slide together. Uh, gonna, I'll show you some other principles, uh, like other ways to equip an object with references to other objects that might be a little bit better. I'm just 
Not sure I really like that because that means when you want to use a Q fetcher, you have to assume that somebody has already initialized SQS2 for you. And it, I don't know. Whereas something about that just seems fishy to me. Uh, another thing that you should uh, hide away is, is business logic. So, or that something that's likely to change that if you can, it would be better to encapsulate it. So when we first receive a message into our system, there's like a hundred different things that we want to do to it uh, to make sure it lands in the same place. But all that code only applies when the message initially arrives. So we used to have a bunch of this stuff inside of like, we have this giant message model right now. And we used to have all this logic that was only ever used one time. And it's, it's pretty complicated, a lot of conditions in it. We, you know, that was all mashed together in this one module. Well, at some point, it became too hard to add new features, too hard to fix bugs. So we created this envelope class. And an envelope is like a, think of, it's just a module that has all the rules to do with, has to do with routing a message. Now we have something that we can test separately. Uh, there's not a lot of coupling between the, the message class and all this code that has to do with delivery. Another principle is uh, program to interfaces, not implementation, which um, just means that you want to, like, don't call it a, a, a car if you could get away with calling it a vehicle. I think that's the, the example that, that Russ uses. Um, and it's easy for Rubyus to do because we're, you know, duct typing is like baked into everything. Um, the best example I can come up with from, from other inbox is like, I never, I'm not really sure what we should call the fundamental unit of thing that uh, we manage for our customers. Like, it started out with we just had email messages. On a certain point, we added features to be able to uh, read RSS feeds for you. And then we also, um, let's see, like, uh, we also now have the idea of uh, we get messages from other sources other than SMTP. And so what we ended up doing is, like, is, is using inheritance. Um, there were some reasons because of the way Active Record works that we wanted to have all this stuff into one table. The point I'm bringing up here is like, I'm not, I, I, maybe we don't need all these subtypes. Maybe we just need to have a more generic name for message, uh, and then you know include different modules or extend objects that like if it's okay if it's an RSS article in this one context, I want to handle it a little bit differently because it's not it's not an HTML message. Anyway, I just wonder if there's some, if you know a good synonym for message that's very general that would include like uh, content that arrives via RSS or that you, you've created and sent through our system, like let me know. But right now it is message, but this is something that we, that we have some struggle with. Another principle, prefer composition over inheritance. And this is actually something that's come up a couple times in the, in the conference already, um, which means instead of doing what I just showed you where you inherit from other objects, you should favor uh, this kind of, or I'm gonna show you two different examples actually. So uh, when we are pulling in those RSS feeds for people, um, like at runtime, you, when you want a feed reader, you can tell the feed reader uh, what, what queuing system you want it to, to connect to. This is like a, maybe a different way of handling that SQS2 problem I showed you before. Uh, and in this case, we almost always know what it is we want, so we provide a useful default. Maybe a, a better example of it would be um, we use uh, S3 a lot, Amazon's S3 service throughout our, our, our app. And there's a lot of different objects that need to have the behavior of being able to send a query to S3 or you know, get data back. And so this is a, like a very small example. Most of, these, most of this stuff actually didn't write. Uh, this is our team, so I don't want to, I'm not taking credit for any of the cool stuff they're doing. It's just, just stuff I've dug up from our code. Uh, and I really like this module because all you have to do is include that S3 message content module anywhere you need it, and then you get a whole bunch of behavior for, for free, and you didn't have to mess up your inheritance chain. And it's easier, easy for us to test that module, and add new things to it without having those, that, that change replicate throughout our app. All right, another principle is delegate, delegate, delegate. Uh, you have objects that express certain outward behavior, but, and so as far as anyone who's using that object knows, uh, it, that's, that's built into your, the class. You don't have, but they, what, under the surface, you're actually forwarding uh, those methods to some other sub-object. So an example is like, this works really well with active record relationships if you're building a Rails app, which uh, in fact, there's even a helper to make it super easy. So in this example, I have an external email account. It has a relationship to an external email server. 
Uh, and anytime, like, but, but if, you, if you're using my external email account and you want to know this information, like, well, what's the server info? What's the mail server? That's not something I actually know. I just forward that to an object that, that I control. But now this gives us the ability to change where that information is stored, how it's computed. Anyone who uses an external email account doesn't care. And this is how you can help avoid law of Demeter violations. Uh, if you're not using Rails, that's totally fine because Ruby comes with two different library modules in the standard library that help you implement a de delegation. So the last thing is not well, doesn't come from uh, the, the original Gang of Four book. It's uh, you ain't gonna need it. And the, you ain't gonna need it, uh, it comes from the fact that we as programmers, most like if you're worth your salt as a programmer, you love cool new problems where you can use cool new toys. You can use the, the latest thing. I mean, I'm always looking I'm always excited about the new cutting edge ways of doing things. But sometimes, well, all the time, you have that demon over your shoulder that's always looking into the future for opportunities to deploy that stuff right now to start using it. So you can get away from all the crappy, crappy legacy stuff you've been doing. Well, I think this is a fatal instinct if you are writing code in a, in a startup. And it's something you have to fight all the time. So, like, in other inbox, it's only two years old. I was the only person working on it for nine months. Um, I have built things to be super scalable that turn out not to be core to the product. Like this is our, our web interface. Um, it has features on the server side um, to make this, like, I, I have, that, like we have a pretty complicated way of giving you differential updates to this web client that I'm not actually sure we're ever ultimately going to need. That's not turned out to be the big sticking point for what makes our app slow. The things that make us slow and performant have to do all that backend processing. So I could have just saved myself a lot of time and gray hairs by not worrying so much about making this super scalable right at the beginning. So I think most people probably, like you probably have that level of understanding of you ain't gonna need it. I mean, here's how I combat it in my own mind. Because uh, it's, it's easier to say this than to actually implement it. Because sometimes you're, you really can convince yourself you are gonna need it. I recommend that in the early days you focus on learning uh, get, you know, getting more data about what you're building and what your customers want and not performance. And I would also ask yourself if there's ways to build an 80% solution. Because like, if you're starting from scratch, getting 80% of the way, way there might be enough for you to learn enough to know whether this is worth pursuing or whether, oh, this really is going to be a performance bottleneck. Do people even care about the thing that, that you made? So those are the best strategies that I know of for combating the tendency to want to overbuild and overdesign, overengineer. Okay, so I've got 11 minutes left. I'm gonna go shotgun through a list of, uh, of things that have plagued me or that I thought were, would be interesting to you guys. If there's any time at the end for questions, I can delve more. So that's our game plan. We're gonna go, this is gonna be really quick. Okay, uh, I would tell myself, plan to move everything out of the web request. So now there's all these really cool tools out there that weren't as available or I wasn't aware of two years ago. Things like uh, uh, AR Mailer, Delay Job, Event Machine, or SQS, or RabbitMQ. I mean, there's all, all these ways to uh, take all the load, to, to, basically to avoid your web app having to do actually any synchronous work inside the web request. But then again, also remember, you ain't gonna need it. So uh, you know, it's probably fine to start off doing something inside the web request, like sending out a, an email message or something like that. But you always should keep in the back of your mind, like, oh, I wonder if there's a way to pull this out of the web request. Because the less time you have to spend worrying about uh, your, your uh, server load, the more time you can be building new stuff, the better. Because you're probably at the beginning not gonna have a network operations person. Uh, on that note, I would say make careful use of concurrency, because that is, something that we have battled with over the past year since we launched right after uh, last year's Lone Star Ruby conference. I would prefer, I think you should prefer uh, different processes communicating via some kind of shared bus. And there's a million different examples out there, not, you know, not even all just Ruby stuff. Um, because it, this is just simpler. And if you're building something that's a learning machine, using this kind of gear where it's all loosely glued together uh, just means you can move faster. Uh, at a certain point, though, it doesn't really make sense to like spin up a new process, and you know that can be a, a, over much. And so, if you if you do want to use multi-threading in your app, and especially if you're building a Rails app, Event Machine has been a really big win for us. So this is like a really typical pattern that is in our code now. 
Um, we send you know, thousands of email messages a day now, and some certain percentage of those take like a really long time, five, 10 seconds, just because this is a dependency on third-party uh, gateways out, or third-party SMTP gateways. So we uh, do email sending asynchronously now through Event Machine. There's more sophisticated ways to do it, but this is just one, one quick example. We just hand it off to Event Machine, and oh, sorry about that, then uh, the web request isn't blocked, our, our mongrels stay happy. Consider your uh, relational database relationship. So, uh, you know, we avoid touching our database when we're not storing, when we're storing non-critical data, when we don't need like OLTP, acid level, uh, awesome integrity in our data, we try and use something else, store that information somewhere else. We don't use the, the database for things that it's not good at. And we, like I've already mentioned, to meet, put the, uh, to meet the, uh, our problems in light of these two concerns, we use something like Amazon Web Services, but there's a million other cool alternate database or alternate data storage systems that have come out in the last year or so. For us, the biggest, the most of the data we store are the contents of messages, so we dump all that into S3. So when you actually view a message in our interface, you're seeing an iframe that's fetching the data from S3. Uh, to, uh, communi to distribute the work across d uh, different machines, we use SQS queues. They just list a list of things that need to be processed. Uh, for, like we log a lot of performance data. It doesn't really matter if we miss any one log item. Uh, and so, and rather than just dumping it all into a text file that we have to then parse later, we just push it into this effectively unlimited infinite database called SimpleDB. Uh, and then we, we, you can use S3 as a kind of an interesting um, caching system, which I can, I can talk about later. Uh, we use the data fabric gem that Mike Perham wrote. He's an Austin uh, programmer, it's really awesome. This has helped us reduce our database woes. So I just wanna put in a plug in there. Okay, so I, I bet everyone in here who has a blog has already written the blog post about how you should use MySQL explain to find your, your tune your queries uh, if you use MySQL and you know, make sure that you have your indices, uh, indices set up properly. But uh, I, you know, prior to embarking on the inbox, did not know very much about uh, the analyze and optimize commands that MySQL has and other databases have their equivalents. The point is that uh, if you can have all the indices you want, but then once your app starts to really experience some good usage, they're gonna degrade over time, and there's this kind of tech that you're gonna have to learn to be able to keep your database healthy and keep yourself from being awake at three in the morning. Along those lines, you, if you are using something like MySQL, I recommend you learn more about how the query planner works. The, one of the biggest speed ups that we've seen in our app has been not from changing any of our code, but just from upgrading to the latest minor version of the database because it had a better query planner. And that, that made a huge difference to us. Uh, our code is not as well organized as I would like it to be, and it's just because we're moving super fast. It's just sometimes easier to dump something into the lib directory, but this is getting pretty unwieldy. And like half of this stuff is plumbing code that could be extracted that, to, that would be of use you know, to other people that we could use in our other projects. If you want to learn more about code layout, I really like the Active Merchant gem. I'll give them, it's like I always return to that when I want to know, like, well, what, what subdirector does this file go in? How, what pattern should I use to require this stuff? Okay, uh, this is something I really am proud of that we do. Uh, I've identified three, lo three types of configuration variables uh, that should be you should have a different strategy for. for. So for stuff that's dangerous or difficult to change, like that shouldn't ever, you, you, it's never going to change. Like th these refer to integer values that we keep in the database. Like we're never gonna make a, a new message is never not gonna be a, a new message. I recommend, that we, we make those constants because they really are immutable. There's another kind of layer of stuff that's like doesn't really change that much. Um, it's, not, there's not, it's not dangerous to change it, but you don't really, you, you, you kind of want it to be somewhat solid. And that's stuff like your host name or these timeout settings. We just dump that into a YAML file that gets loaded at runtime, and then you can uh, create different, um, override that, those defaults for different environments. And then there's a category of stuff that, like if, any, if a non-programmer wants to be able to mess with it or look at it, then uh, we keep that you know, in, the, in the database, or I guess you could stuff it into a memcache or something like that. So for example, uh, Admins at our company need to be able to, on the fly, change like what addresses you're not allowed to use. Um, we use 
to, 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 to provide this facility I'm showing you, we use the settings plugin, which is really cool. You should check it out. And also, this blog article, is this is something you're struggling with in your app. He does a really good job of explaining um, why you should do things this way, or, or actually a little bit better approach than what I showed you. I, every time we use Boolean columns, I've always regretted it because you always want to know the time that something changed, or you end up needing more than two states. So I always like work really hard to make sure, is this really going to be a true or false? Because something like this, if, once the table grows to like a million, two million rows, it can be very difficult to make a change like this. So I'm always like really paranoid about it now. Um, if you know about, if you've heard of, how many people have heard of presenters before? Jay Fields has blogged about it. This has been a huge win for us. It uh, encapsulates a lot of complex logic just in that advanced refresher class there. If you want to know, see more about this, come find me. I'll show you an example. Uh, and I would say don't, maybe you shouldn't test all the time at the beginning. It's a very controversial opinion, I know. I'm sure it will upset some of you. But I, in the first weeks of building other inbox, I feel, I feel like I was overly zealous about testing, and it, and it slowed down exploration. Uh, half the stuff I wrote, I, I threw away anyway. I changed the names of a lot of the stuff that I wrote, even while I was being so diligent about test-first development. But on the other hand, if you use the test as a design tool, as you would in the BDD approach, maybe, you know, maybe this actually will help you save time and make your get, get to your final design quicker. All the code that we use to get your messages from SMTP that's really mission critical, I wrote using the BDD approach, and it's been some of the most reliable stuff that we have. So I'm kind of on the fence about that, and that's why I'm really curious to know if the Rails Rumbles teams, the, you know, like, do the ones who write tests, are they faster, do they win more often? I, I think somebody should do that. I'd be really interested. Um, if you are running a development team or you're the owner of a startup, I encourage you to afford regular access to graphic designers. Because um, even if you have developers that are talented at design or that can, you know, can mess with Photoshop, it's a really expensive context switch. So the best time I ever had working on another inbox was when we built this interface because we had a designer who knew how to use Git and knew you know, Herb and Haml and could really like, was making commits to our repository. And it just was so much easier than having to like, take the output of this designer and somehow translate it into something that would make sense in Rails. And so it was just a really happy, productive time that allowed me to get through more of those ferocious iterations. Okay, so we have a minute and a half. Does anybody have any questions? Well, I mean, it, I mean, it, was, it was nice to have a designer who, uh, who could speak a little bit more of my language than I was used to. What's the well, the alternative would be like a designer who just gives you of, of, of you know, like the cut up, cut up of a Photoshop file and maybe some CSS, and it's like up to you to figure out, to integrate it into your app. So what you're saying is a key step for your app is that you have a designer that can work with you. Yes, the, a, key, a key success factor for us to, so far is that we had this guy who was able to work with our tools. We had a really short deadline last year because we had a big PR event when we launched it, and like if I had to do all that integration, it would have taken a lot longer. So one, one more question. Okay, this is uh, this uh, I'm about to show you. It needs a whole lot of refactoring. So I'm not saying this is good code. It started off a lot smaller than this. Um, that we have a, a presenter that is kind of based on what Jay Fields presented on his blog. Oh, me, oh, sorry, that's not very helpful. Uh, so. It, this needs to be refactored to be a bunch of separate classes and modules, but I think this will give you the gist of what I'm talking about. Um, the idea is I have a controller here that, um, well, is that re that's really all it does. It just wants to return a chunk of JSON to that web client, but to make that chunk of JSON, we have to join together information from like six different uh, objects in our, um, in our system. So that's all the advanced refresher does, is it has this two hash method um, that uh, builds up ultimately this hash down here of uh, objects that the client should create, objects that the client should delete, and objects that the client should change. And then it, uh, the, like, the way we get those, that list of things to create is we just, it's just calling, it's like a, this is a, a really just one giant function composed of smaller functions. So if we go to created messages, uh, you know, uh, it just, it just kind of, this has gotten really overgrown and wieldy. The point is, like, 
have all this crazy uh, logic because we're using archive tables and triggers and stuff like that. Um, well, th that uh, all this complex logic is completely abstracted away from anyone who needs to know about it. So if you ever want to get a list of things that changed, updated, or deleted since you last asked about it, you just call advanced refresher. And then I have a lot of work to do, do here to, to clean it up. Another common example is if you have a form, like with a, an account name, and, a, and a, like if you have a form that has three objects on it that all have to be created at once or presented at once, people will use a presenter so that when you're writing the view code, you just have to worry about your one presenter, not these three different objects. So that's a really quick example. I'll look at Jay Fields' blog for more. So, all right, uh, I just want to end by saying all the slides are at my blog, uh, sabelski.com. Thank you very much. All right, we got a 15 minute break. <laughs>